I have right in front of me the M3 Pro MacBook Pro, Apple's replacement to the M2 Pro 14 inch MacBook Pro. However, this isn't the cheapest 14 inch MacBook Pro Apple sells anymore. Now there's a cheaper model that starts at $1,600. But for that one, you're only getting the new M3 chip, not the M3 Pro chip. Apple's completely dropped the 13 inch touch bar MacBook Pro and replaced it with this new more upscale 14 inch MacBook Pro with M3 chip that takes the design elements of the 14 inch MacBook Pro. The only difference between the M3 and M3 Pro MacBook Pro other than of course the chip inside is that the M3 variant only has two Thunderbolt 4 ports and only has support for one external monitor just like all other non-pro non-max Apple silicon chips. So if we're looking at direct replacements the $2,000 variant with the M3 Pro is the direct replacement for that outgoing M2 Pro MacBook Pro. That being said, there is a new color and it is this nice space black color. And if you compare it to the outgoing space gray model, you'll notice it's exactly what they say. It's still not black, but it's a much deeper gray, especially when you compare it to the M2 MacBook Air, which has a midnight color that's more of a dark blue than a gray or a black. The body is supposed to be more finger resistant than the other dark colors, because if you see here, this midnight colorway picks up a lot of fingerprints. But I will like to point out that with these darker laptops, I've also noticed much more wear around the ports because the underlying metal beneath it is not a dark color. So you'll already notice that after over a year of use, there's a lot of wear and tear around the port. The M3 MacBook Pro also gets slightly more RAM than the outgoing model and a slightly brighter screen, very minimal updates. However, when you dig into the specs or you run some benchmarks, that's when you start noticing a very strange trend. Just to give some context, the laptop that I'm currently using right now is still the M1 Pro 14 inch MacBook Pro. That laptop met my needs so well, I didn't really see a reason to upgrade to the M2 lineup. But now with this M3 Pro, I thought it was time. I thought it was time. And I'm sad to say, I don't necessarily think that's the case. Here's some quick benchmarks. These are based on the laptops that I've had. However, for the M2 configuration you see is not actually my result since I actually got rid of the M2 MacBook Pro that I was using before. I know there's ways that people could fudge these numbers, but this M2 Pro benchmark looked very similar to all the other M2 Pro benchmarks that I saw on the site. And if you really compare these benchmarks, there isn't much of a bump. I thought, oh, you know, this could be just the benchmark. Let's try actually pulling out a game that would rely on the GPU. This is a number that I got a while back when I was reviewing the M2 Pro, so it might be slightly outdated, but you'll notice the M2 Pro, running on older software, right, still ran better than what I'm getting out of the M3 Pro. So in summary, there's a small CPU performance bump coming from the M2 Pro to the M3 Pro and a very slightly GPU decline coming from the M2 Pro to the M3 Pro, all considering paying the exact same $2,000 price tag. Why did they decide to do this? I really think it goes two ways. They really needed to differentiate between the Pro lineup of chips and the Max lineup of chips. Before this, the main differentiator between the Pro and the Max was GPU performance. They varied dramatically between the two chips and CPU performance were roughly the same or got very close until you started maxing out the Max. So what they did this year was to not focus on the Pro chip and keep it relatively similar to the previous year and really added a lot of performance on the side of the Max. If you look up all the different benchmarks right now out there for the M3 Max, it is significantly faster than the M2 Max. There's already a bunch of great videos on that right now. I didn't get the Max, so I can't really show you that level of performance. The second piece of significance is that now, along the entire Apple lineup, there is a path to upsell you for every piece of the way. Just for example, right now, if you look at Apple's iPad lineup, there's very good segmentation that they've done here. The iPad Pros have the latest chip, the iPad Air has a last generation chip, while the other iPads are picking up the scraps and have lower end mobile chips from their iPhones. And I think they're doing the same thing, this same type of segmentation to their Mac lineup. The Pros will always have the latest chip between the M3, the M3 Pro, the M3 Max, and whatever desktop M3 Ultra that they eventually release. While the Air, probably moving forward, will use last generation chips like the M2. But of course, this is all just a guess. But if you look along this pathway between the MacBook Air all the way up to the M3 Max MacBook Pro, there is very strategically placed price points along the way. The M2 MacBook Air is just $1,100. You want a bigger screen? 
get the 15 inch MacBook Air and that's only $1,300. Oh, you want a little bit more performance than that and a better screen? Well, get the $1,600 MacBook Pro. Oh, you want more performance? Get the $2,000 MacBook Pro with 16 gigabytes of RAM and giving you access to multiple monitors beyond just one external display. That not enough performance for you? You want extreme performance? Get the MacBook Pro with M3 Max. That one has all the performance you could possibly need in a laptop. They've really made it easy for you to justify upselling yourself onto a better machine. And I think that was their overall goal with this type of segmentation. And honestly, between those two points that I mentioned, it kind of worked because I'm kind of disappointed in the performance that I'm getting out of this M3 Pro MacBook Pro to the point that I'm considering upgrading to the M3 Max, which costs around $1,000 more than the M3 Pro version. So with those two factors combined, it makes it really hard for me to look at the $2,000 version of this laptop and go, this is a great buy. But I know it is, especially if you're coming from an older Intel machine. For us users that are already on the Apple Silicon train, I don't see the value of upgrading from an M1 Pro to an M3 Pro. You would see much more value if you're upgrading from an M1 Pro to a M3 Max chip. However, I did play around with the configurator on Apple's site for these new laptops. And I found that there is an M3 Max variant that's cheaper than what Apple's offering on one of their standard configurations where you get half the storage, but you're also paying $200 less. So if you don't mind about waiting for a custom order versus just walking in the store and buying it, that might be a good option too. Okay, to summarize how I feel about the new M3 Pro lineup of MacBook Pros, I would say the M3 is all right. The M3 Pro is not the best and the M3 Max is Fantastic. I hope that summarizes my opinions pretty well. I kind of tried a different style with this video. It's much more off the cuff and not scripted because I wanted this video to come out pretty soon. Scripted videos take so much longer. However, I do plan to do much more long-term reviews of these M3 machines, like a one month, six month, or one year review. So be on the lookout for that. Anyway, I'll see y'all next time. Bye.